publishing. Um, a little bit about the background to that, please. Yeah, so this uh, all really began in earnest in the autumn of 2014, when a couple of publishers took a punt on publishing um, social media talent who had started as YouTube creators and translated this into books. So a publisher called Blink uh, signed up a YouTuber called Alpi Days and his book was publishing in October 2014 and they organised a signing for him at Waterstones Piccadilly. Kind of thinking, you know, what's your max turnout? 100, 200 people? And uh, unfortunately for them, 9,000 children turned up. Uh, all of Piccadilly, Piccadilly Circus was shut down for an entire day. And that kind of kick-started the phenomenon that is social media publishing. So a few weeks after that, um, Penguin Random House Children's, where I now work, published the first book by uh, Zoella, which is called um, Girl Online, and it was her first YA novel. And we have a video about it, but basically it became the fastest selling daily novel of all time, selling 78,000 copies in three days. So I don't know if you want to... Um said really only began in 2014 so it's an incredibly short time scale for something that really has has revolutionized the the publishing industry certainly in the UK so Holly you've talked about these sort of first couple of authors do you want to just expand a little bit on the on the sort of the narrative uh, other other people that then came after, after yeah them? absolutely so I was lucky enough to work with Marcus Butler just up there and uh, from that point really uh, there has been just an epidemic of social media publishing to the extent where every book is so different and uh, there's just been unprecedented success across the board. Most publishers have now taken part in it. And I've been lucky enough to now move to Penguin Random House Children's, which really kick-started the whole thing with Zoella to kind of focus on it properly. Because as you can see, there's a huge range of, of books there. So everything from graphic novels to lifestyle books to YA, you know, it's a really creative and exciting part of publishing to be in. And what's so wonderful about it is, as you see, every signing is a bit like a pop concert. And it's amazing to see young readers so excited about books. And I think, for me, coming from the sales background, the first thing you notice is not the jazzy covers, it's the numbers with the K. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these numbers are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, um, I mean, and just, just to, so they, these are sales for... Just their first, first book. So many of them, most of them actually, have gone on to publish more. So this is just the UK TCM sales of their first books only. So if we look there at Girl Online, 611. Yes, um, and then now this is the uh, that's book three, which released in November. And we think the combined sales of her three books might be well, yeah. well over well, well, over, well over a million. Yeah. yeah. So I think for those of you that were at my session this morning when I was talking about the reality of being a small independent publisher, I mean we couldn't be at a, at a sort of more different end of the scale. And it's you know it's so interesting to think that our industry encompasses both these both these aspects. I think. Um, now, 
you're, you went quite recently to Penguin Random House. Well, tell us about your job. Why, why do they need someone like you? What, what, what's, the, what's your role on a daily basis? What's, you know, what, what, what do you do? So I work for the children's division, so that encompasses a huge variety of authors from Roald Dahl right up to Zoella. So really mixing the classics and the new. And my job really is to focus on the new and uh, encouraging young readers and new readers to come along with us. And uh, I think it really came about because young people are now watching over a billion hours a day of YouTube across the world which is just a phenomenally staggering number. And it's obviously such a buoyant books market that it's really exciting to be able to focus on that properly. Mm -hmm. And how do you find your authors? Do you, do you sit in the office all day watching YouTube or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Come> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are many tools. I'm sure um, you know, other people talked about this today for finding emerging talent. But actually, if you immerse yourself in the world, it's really interesting. and quite a lot of these YouTubers are represented by the same management company, so they feature in each other's videos, and it's a very small world, um, the UK YouTube community, so you get to meet a lot of creators through already established names. And, I mean, I, I can see from a publishing perspective that, you know, you have, I mean, the, the, the number of followers on Twitter and Instagram that these, uh, now authors, but these celebrities, these YouTubers bring with them, just tell us a little bit about the sort of size of following that we're, we've got for some of these authors. I mean, Zoe is probably the biggest up here, apart from PewDiePie. She has, across all of her channels, and, and she's probably got about 20 million followers. Um, but most, yeah, everybody on this world has got over 2 million. So we were talking um, this morning about the importance now in a sort of more traditional publishing environment where it's, it's difficult to sign an author if they don't engage on social media. I mean, you know, and we're really looking for authors that at least will send the odd tweets. Here we're absolutely, you know, at the other end of the scale. And I, I mean, obviously the advances that we're offering these authors are presumably enormous because you know that your, your sales are to some extent guaranteed. If someone brings 20 million followers with them, I mean, how many sales would you predict? If someone's got 20 million followers, how many of those could you convert to sales when you're sort of doing the maths to start with? Well, that's the really interesting thing because there is no hard and fast rule. It's always about the book. And that's the really encouraging thing about being an editor in this space as well, is that the book comes first. And if the content is good, if it's a great novel or if it's offering something different, you know, like the Joe Wicks that we heard so much about this morning, it's that that really makes the difference. It's not just a subscribe account. And also, you can look very closely at engagement levels, which are actually a lot more important than just subscribe accounts. So, for example, I would rather commission somebody who has 200,000 subscribers but gets a million views per video than somebody who has a million subscribers but only gets 200,000 views. But presumably you now have competitors in other publishing companies doing exactly the same thing. Yes. So they'd be looking for something similar. Yes. How do you get there first? Well, uh, you can't always. <laughs> but there are new platforms emerging all the time. If you look at Musical.ly, obviously Instagram has really come up in a big way since this all started. Um, there's always new things to be looking for. And it sometimes feels a bit crowded. And then you just have to sit back and remember there are thousands of people who have really successful channels. And they're all creative. So there's endless possibilities. And that's and again, one of the really exciting things about it. So I think one of the things I was interested in um, when uh, Holly and I first had a chat was you've got these uh, celebrities, these YouTubers, who already have, you know, for their publishing is just one sort of string to their bow, isn't it? You know, we've got Zoella there. She's, she's got her, you know, her lifestyle channel I was reading. She makes 50,000 pounds a week just from marketing on her lifestyle channel. She's got beauty products that sold out in their first day when they were launched in the UK. Why don't these authors just self-publish? Why, why, why don't they, I mean, why have they come to a traditional publisher? I, I mean, in some ways it's perhaps surprising. They're breaking all the other rules. Why don't they just, I don't know, get a relationship with a, a, a printer or self, or do something different? Tell me about that. What, what do you add as a publisher? Well, you know how difficult it is to distribute, you know, being a small publisher. So we bring 
something different at every level. We can say what's working in the marketplace, we give real editorial expertise, we make sure that the book is as good as it possibly can be, well packaged, and the publicity and marketing element takes YouTubers to a whole new audience often. So if you're a creator, you often have a huge online following, but the mainstream media has really passed you by. Mm -hmm. So if you have a book, that's a way of also having a publicist and a marketer and somebody who's working really closely with you and taking you to, to a whole new level. So in some ways it's the exact opposite of the mainstream publishing industry where you know we're often as, as editors and publishers desperately seeking to engage with the online media. You know, how do we get this book that's been reviewed somewhere? How do we get it more coverage on Instagram or whatever? You've got the other model and perhaps would I be right in thinking there's some sort of validation by being published by a mainstream publisher. If, if you're Zoella or Joe Suggs or uh, Marcus Butler, the fact that your book has been deemed worthy to be published by Penguin Random House, is there an element of that sort of validation? I mean, I hope so, but I can't really <laughs> speak for that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, do you want to just tell me, uh, one of the things I found quite interesting was uh, talking about uh, your sort of launches of these events. I mean, would you like to just tell us a couple of examples of these are just not bookshop signings, are they? What, what sort of things does one do to... Uh, and, and within that, I, on your thing, I think it said that there were 14,000 pre-signed copies. How does one sign 14,000 pre-signed copies? Tell us about that process. I mean, I wouldn't, but uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of time and you get a lot of book plates delivered to your house. That's how it works. But, um, I, I mean, I can't take credit for all of this publishing, but I know that Joe Sugg had a signing at the Emirates Stadium at Arsenal, so, you know, huge quantities of people go to that. And um, Dan and Phil, who were published by Ebury, had a really successful live show that went with their first book, where I think they sold tens of thousands of tickets, and that was kind of co-organised with the publisher. So it was, the book is all about the world of Dan and Phil, and the, and the stage show was like that too. So there are so many creative marketing publicity opportunities. And you're selling a ticket to an event that's a ticket selling it. itself, but it, or it includes a copy of the book? Yes. And then do these authors sign these, th how does it work? I mean, do, do, do the, you talk, I know we talk about audience reader engagement, but how, if I turn up to one of these signings, what's the chances of me actually standing in front of the author in the way that I would stand in front of an author at the, uh, the Emirates Lit Fest here? Well, since the first uh, fiasco, the 9,000 children turning up to Alpha Day signing, it's now ticketed. So it depends on the author. Everybody wants to do different things, but if you get a ticket to go to a signing, you will meet the author. And uh, presumably it's very choreographed. I mean, how many seconds is one permitted? I mean, these yeah. are important logistics, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And, you know, the, the creator often wants to spend the most possible time with the fan. And then as the publisher, you kind of want them to see as many people as possible mm -hmm. to sell the most books. So it is a difficult balance, but everybody's such a pro at it now. Every retailer is really yeah. slick. So it works. It works. Um, now this, this whole genre of publishing has, has not been without criticism. Um, I think one of the interesting discussions that's happened very recently um, is that just last week um, two novels were named um, the nation's favourite amongst, this is in the UK, amongst secondary school students, two of Zoella's uh, novels. Um, so there's been a, a sort of debate, I mean the headline in The Guardian was Zoella is an artist of self-engrossment who has become corporate gold dust and a publishing phenomenon. And the, 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 you know, the article is, is really not very complimentary about, about, the, uh, about the books because what it's, what it's effectively saying is that the, the, the publishing is um, unchallenging. We're calling it unchallenging fiction. Um, and I think you know, perhaps somewhat unfairly, there's, there's been a sort of... The debate has been whether the contribution of these authors has contributed to the, the declining teen literacy rates. Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, what, what would you say if I say to you, why, you know, do we really need books like this? I can, I can see the value to the publishing company is great for sales, but do, do, we need, do we need our children to be reading books like this? Well, I don't see how there can be a correlation between people reading more books and declining literacy rates. You know, we publish such a wide variety of voices and we've always got to keep moving, keep children engaged, 
keep working with the consumer and keeping up with they want with what they want. And the girl online books are really good. And perhaps a Guardian journalist might find them unchallenging, but I don't think you know the reader are there intended for them to do. Uh, Zoe has done a huge amount for teen literacy as well in terms of her uh, book club that she runs with WH Smith, which is just an amazing thing that she... Tell us a little bit about that. What's the structure of that? So I don't know if you're familiar with the Richard and Judy book club, but it's quite similar to that. She selects uh, a certain number of books, promotes them on her channel, and they're given a slot in WH Smith's. And every single one that she touches, mm. turns, you know, their sales go through the roof. And I think that it's quite unfair to blame her the person who's doing perhaps more for teen literacy than anybody else for, for the declining rate. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things, I mean, this is definitely a sort of phase two of celebrity publishing, I think, because when we, I think sort of perhaps 10 years ago, we were talking about celebrity biographies or celebrity publishing. These were people who had become celebrities through, through doing something. So it might be, you know, you might have your celebrity chef or your celebrity footballer or an actor. And, you know, there, there is this sort of, um, snobby, snob, snobbism in the industry, isn't there? There's sort of about celebrity books, you know, there's, there's your literary critics and then your people doing your literary fiction, um, and then there's, there's perhaps a sort of element of, oh, uh, these are celebrity biographies. Now, we all know in terms of sales what works best, and you know, by the definition of success I was talking about this morning, then, you know, absolutely, that this is, this is what works, it's what keeps the publishing company in business to some extent. But, um, the, the, again, the, the sort of these were all the first wave were sort of celebrities who did something and then published a book about it, as it were. Whereas these books, I'm just I'm fascinated in this phenomenon that you know when I was talking to you earlier about Marcus Butler, you know what did he do before becoming a YouTuber? Well, nothing. He was age 16 when he was a, a first began on YouTube. So I think there's there's possibly that's that's maybe something for people perhaps of my generation or above, you know, trying to get our heads around, why would I be interested in reading about this person when what they've been doing is sitting at the computer all day playing Minecraft? What can possibly, you know, be of interest? So how, just tell me, how do you cope with that argument? What, or what do the authors say to, to that argument? Well, first of all, I would say that this is a brand new strand of publishing that has not detracted in any way from everything else that corporate publishers are putting out there. You know, us publishing Zoe has not made less room for George Orwell. It's, you know, they're two very different things. So what I would say is really going back to what I was saying earlier, which is that the content of the book is incredibly important. It's a very discerning audience. These uh, fans interact with the creators on a daily basis and they are very proud of them and what they've achieved. And you can't put any old rubbish into the marketplace. Every book that does well, does well because it's a good book. Mm. And you can't just rely on a follower account. So I think that the main issue for me is if I hear that argument, which I, I never do actually, I feel like everybody's very supportive of each other's publishing, it's just, what I'm doing is very specific, and it's for young people, and it is nothing but a positive thing in, in my eyes. Um, and then, if, can you just tell us a little bit about um, what what you have coming forward? So, in your your own list, you have these um, th th these books that we have here. What's in your sort of your next year? You know, what's the things that you're excited about yourself that you've commissioned or you've got coming up? I'm working on a really exciting new series uh, in the clean teen space by a YouTuber called Connie Glynn, uh, who is writing a kind of um, Harry Potter meets the Princess Diaries type boarding school series. And she's writing herself and vlogging the entire process. I really recommend watching those videos if you get a chance. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And then everything else is not announced yet, so I can't <laughs> Okay. Um, and I think, you know, what you're saying there, almost in passing, about she's, she's vlogging the process. I mean, you know, in terms of getting people engaged in the publishing process and the build-up to, um, to launch, I mean, this is an absolutely brilliant way of, of guaranteeing your pre-sales, isn't it? Well, that and also establishing her as a credible writer. I mean, the writing process, as we all know, is very, very hard, and she's a young woman who's writing her first novel and actually sharing that experience with her fans, saying, look, I'm finding this difficult, but I'm really excited about this scene or this chapter. It gives that authenticity um, and, and it's really inspiring for young people as well. Um, and then 
Holly, we would, I was just going to ask a little bit to put it in co this sort of whole phenomenon in context here in um, in Dubai or in the Middle East more generally. Do we know if this phenomenon exists here? Is the social media publishing here in the Middle East? I actually don't know much about the publishing. I know that there is a really strong YouTube community and a lot of social media activity here. Uh, I know that we published Zoe here in export in English language uh, and has, she's done very well here. The YA market is very buoyant and she has fans here. We've also sold Arabic rights. So that's kind of the extent of my experience. Mm -hmm. But across the world, that you know, this kind of publishing is existing. I mean, it's, it's strong in the States and in Australia. So I can't see where we be here. So I just want to ask Holly one more question and then we'll open up and, and perhaps if somebody knows about uh, this sort of social media publishing in the region then it would be wonderful to have your comments on that. Um, but Holly, I'll just uh, sort of finish with perhaps the, the obvious question um, you know, as outlined in the, in the, in the uh, title of this panel. Where are we going? Where, I mean, five years ago, I don't think we could have predicted where we are today. So where will we be in another five years? Give us your predictions. I, who knows, but I, <laughs> I really don't think that um, the connection between internet talent and publishing is going to go away because if you're a young, creative, talented person, you find your voice online and those voices will always translate well into fiction and non-fiction publishing. Well, thank you.